Hello, so this video follows on from the multi-store model video uh, and this one's looking specifically at types of long-term memory. Uh, so in the multi-store model, uh, let's remind ourselves, this was by Action and Schifrin, uh, they suggest that there were three stores, information goes into the sensory register, if you pay attention to it, it gets transferred to the short-term memory, and if that is then rehearsed, it goes into long-term memory. And if you remember, when we evaluated Atkinson and Schifrin's uh, idea and, and that model, we said that, well, this, this idea that it just goes into one long-term memory store, it doesn't seem like that, that that's enough detail, it's a bit oversimplified, there needs to be a bit more than that. Um, and actually maybe there are separate types of long-term memory and that makes a lot of sense um, so you know your your knowledge of something uh, a capital city uh, uh, the actor who played a certain role uh, that knowledge is different than knowing how to tie your shoelace both of those are long-term memory both of those you'd like you'd like to hope that you would know for a few years maybe um, so it's long term but understandably though those are quite different sorts of memory so this is what we're talking about here when we're talking about different types of long-term memory and it was Tolving that suggested that there are three different types of long-term memory um, so the first is what we call episodic memory uh, and like quite often in psychology it does what it says on the tin episodic like episodes, so think of your favourite Netflix series, different episodes, so a different point in time. Um, so, like, yeah, like a diary entry. So, episodic memory has what we call time stamps. Um, so, you know when these things happened, um, and you'll be able to recall places and people and things that happened. So, think about what you did for your last birthday. So when you think about that, you're, you will go back in time to a certain time in your life, like a diary entry, um, and hopefully you'll know who you were with, where you were, what you did. That is an episodic type of long-term memory. Um, because of that, everyone's episodic memory is going to be different. What I did for my last birthday will be very different for what you did to the person next to you, to your best mate. So episodic memories are, are quite individual and personalised. They also require some conscious recall. You might not be able to know straight away exactly what you did for your last birthday. You might have to sit and think about it. So when I say they require conscious recall, that's what I mean. You can't, it doesn't just come to you straight away. Uh, you actually have to think about it. Semantic is the next type of long-term memory, uh, and this is what we'd call knowledge. So this is our knowledge. These are facts and figures. So you know that Paris is the capital of France. You know that Chelsea are the best team in England. You know that a woman's place is in the kitchen. It's things that you know for fact um, that, that you don't really have to think about. So these aren't... Sorry, you do have to think about them. Um, these aren't time stamped, so you might not know when you learned th these things, um, when you learned that Paris was the capital of France, when you learned Chelsea were the best team in England, probably when they, you know, kept winning the league and Champions League and things like that. When a woman's place is in the kitchen, yeah, um, the less said about that, the better. Um, these do require conscious recall though, so if I were to ask you what the capital of Australia is, you might, some people might skip straight to Sydney, maybe, but that's actually incorrect, it's Canberra. So you might have to sit and think about that. Um, so again, it requires conscious recall, you have to think about these things. Think of doing a quiz, you're getting asked quiz questions, you're using your semantic memory, you're using your facts. The third type is known as procedural memory, and this is memory of processes. Um, so this would be knowing how to ride a bike, so you put one foot in front of the other, up and down. Knowing how to kick a psychology teacher in the groin for being a chauvinistic pig. Yeah, there you go. I don't actually think that a woman's place in the kitchen. I'm really sorry that I said that. Please don't get offended, any feminists. Um, I didn't mean it. It's a joke. Um, so, but it helps to demonstrate, yeah, the procedural memory. So learning how to tie your shoelaces. Anything that you do where it's a process, um, this is your procedural memory. These don't require conscious recall. You should just be able to do them. Again, think of D David Beckham taking a free kick. He's probably not thinking that, oh right, how do I do this again? All right, Victoria, how do I take a free kick? Oh, sorry, that was an awful, awful impression. Um, but, you know, if you were to jump on a bike, you shouldn't need to think about it. You, you just do it. So that doesn't require conscious recall. So these are the different types uh, of, of long-term memory, according to Tolving. 
So looking at these different types of long-term memory then, we need to ask ourselves, are, is this a good explanation of long-term memory? Do these different types of long-term memory actually exist? Um, and so we'll look at some evaluation. When I was looking at the multi-store model, I mentioned case studies. The case studies are really, really handy. If you've looked at your research methods, you'll know that when we look at case studies, it allows us to look at things that maybe would be really difficult to study otherwise. Um, and the case studies that we're looking at here are people that have had brain damage, um, and they can help us to understand further about memory. They allow us to test our, our theories um, when it's hard to do otherwise, because obviously you couldn't get thousands of people with these issues. So I mentioned HM before, uh, and then we're going to look at another one called Clive Waring. So HM, HM uh, had his corpus callosum cut, the, the bit that holds the two hemispheres of the brain together, um, and had memory issues because of it. So what we, they found was that HM had poor episodic memory. So he didn't know the timeline in his life, he couldn't, um, didn't know what happened in the afternoon, he wouldn't know what he had for, for lunch or what happened the, the, the evening before. His episodic memory was really poor, but he did have semantic memory. He could remember objects, he knew what a chair was because he, he had learnt it uh, a long time ago. So it's not as though his whole long-term memory had gone, parts of it had and other parts hadn't. So that HM backs up the idea that there are separate types of long-term memory. Um, there's another person called Clive Waring. Um, Clive Waring had uh, brain damage and he now again has really poor episodic memory. He doesn't know who he's met that day so there's a really good video, I'll try and find the clip for you, um, where he thinks that he hasn't met his wife even though he has only only moments earlier. Uh, so he doesn't know what, what day of the week it is but he's a really really skilled musician and he can still play the piano. So that knowledge, that long-term memory is still there. And it backs up the idea that there are these different types of long-term memory. Long-term memory is not just one store, one area, um, which is what um, Atkinson and Schifrin would have suggested in the, in the multi-store model. There are these se separate types, which is, which is really, um, it's good that they're supported. So that's one good evaluative point. You would need to evaluate the use of case studies, however. Um, and that's another evaluative point on its own. So using HM and Clive Waring are great because we can't study it otherwise. However, you need to be really, really careful at generalizing the results of case studies to other populations. So these guys have had brain damage. They're, they're, they're very rare. They're, they're not representative of, the, of everyone else. They, they don't represent in, in, in common as what a, a healthy person, how they remember. So because they've had brain damage, can we apply their results? Can we apply their, their separate areas of their, their long-term memory to the general population? Well, probably not. And that's an issue with case studies. It, it's control. There could be other things that have affected their memory um, and it's not maybe backing up the, what we thought it would. Going on from this though, there is support that isn't from case studies. So that adds more weight to the idea that there are these separate types of long-term memory. And this was Tolving et al. Um, and Tolving et al. gave participants PET scans, positron emission tomography, so brain scans basically, and got them to recall different types of long-term memory. Sometimes they were asked them to recall episodic memory, so memory that's time-stamped, and sometimes they were asked them to recall knowledge, uh, fact, semantic memory. And what they found was different areas of the brain were activated when they were recalling these different types of memory. So when they were asked to recall episodic memory, their run right prefrontal cortex, um, so cortex is the, is the outer side of the brain, uh, prefrontal at the front and obviously the right hand side, that was what was, was activated. Whereas when they were asked to recall facts, semantic memory, it was the left prefrontal cortex. So the fact that there are physical differences in the way the brain is working when they're recalling these different types of long-term memory, again adds weight to the idea that there are different types of long-term memory, it's not one unitary store. And finally, um, we will go with some contradictory research, maybe. Um, so I guess it goes against Tolving's idea that there are three types of long-term memory. Cohen and Squire agree that there are different types of long-term memory, but they only split it into what they call declarative and non-declarative um, memory. So they argue uh, that episodic and semantic memories are declarative, um, and that they, they basically um, clump them together. And then you've 
got that which are undeclarative, which would be the procedural. So for Cohen and Squire, there are only two types of long-term memory. So this is an evaluative point because it suggests, well, actually, okay, yeah, we will look at long-term memory as having different stores, but how do we divide that? And Cohen and Squire almost see episodic and semantic as the same sort of memory. So who's got it right? Is it Tolving? Is it Cohen and Squire? Um, it, it's difficult to know. Um, and you know, you can't just take that that one bit of information uh, as fact. Okay, I hope that's been helpful for you. Um, it should add to your multi-store model knowledge, uh, and there, there's more information in the Illuminate textbook. As I've previously said, that, that there's a there's a link in in the uh, description below if you need more information. If you haven't got that book already, uh, please subscribe if you haven't already. I'll try and get the rest of the memory videos done to help you out as well. Okay, thank you.